All right. For every one of you that had a bad week, Josh, you can listen up. Um, bless me, Lord, is a common prayer that we pray. You know, you're going through your week and uh, it just seems like everything's going wrong. You should be praying, Lord, please bless my work, please bless my health, please bless my family, please bless my, my listening and hearing your voice. Uh, praying for blessing is, is something we need all the time. And what are we asking for when you're asking for blessing? You're asking God to, to let things go better. Let everything go better in these areas because I don't have what it takes. And the truth is we don't and we never have. And God intended us to live in a constant drawing off of his strength through his blessing us. Well, in Revelation, as we work our way through, we want to remember that another way to receive God's needed blessing in your life is found. And we've already covered it, but I want to remind you about it. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. So you and I need blessing, but in addition to asking God for it through prayer, he says, the book of Revelation is a way of releasing his blessing into your life. You need it. I need it. He says, don't just read the book and hear the book, but heed the lessons that are in this book. You will have God's blessing poured into your life. And who doesn't need that? So we're going to continue today looking at Revelation chapter 10, and today it's on three lessons to heed for God's blessing in your life, for a God-blessed life. Three lessons to heed. Um, could you stand more blessing? Yeah. So let's heed this. God has three lessons for us to learn this morning. All right, let's review where we've been. We uh, took a week off, but... Uh, Going through the parts of Revelation that talk about the future, which starts in chapters 4 and 5, we saw in that chapter that Jesus takes the scroll of saving the world, this scroll with seven seals on it. It's the scroll that once all those seals are open, the world is going to change from the kingdom of men to the kingdom of God. It's finally here. All the waiting is over. And so in chapter 6, that is the unsealing of the first six seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, and with each of those seals, a terrible event of God's justice was released upon the world. Uh, that was chapter six. And then it's like, okay, what's left? The only thing that's left is, is seal number seven, and then the kingdom of men become the kingdoms of God. So what it happens in chapter seven? Instead of the expected seal, there's a pause. A pause before the seventh seal. If you remember, this is where uh, God chooses the 144,000 Jewish Christians to protect them with his name stamped on their foreheads. And they're going to go through the tribulation without experiencing the terrible things. So now we then come to chapters 8 and 9. We say, oh, well, this is it. This is the seventh seal. This is the end. What are we going to have? And all eyes turn to see the seventh seal opens up seven Angels come out with seven trumpets. So instead of this being the very last step, there's seven more steps in this last step. And the rest of those chapters go on to reveal the seven trumpets then, or six of the seven trumpets are, are blown, and with each of those, like the seal, a release of God's terrible justice upon the world happens, and we've gone over that. But now we're at the point with, okay, so the seventh seal had seven trumpets. We've done six trumpets. Now with chapter 10, we have the time for the last and final seventh trumpet. And with this, is, everything is completed. So all eyes turn to chapter 10 to see what this last angel is going to sound and what's going to happen. Chapter 10 then, verses 1 through 3. Let's read together. And I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book which was open, and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Okay, chapter 10, we all turn to see the seventh angel blow his trumpet, and it's another pause. He did this <laughs> before the seventh seal, and now he's done this before the seventh trumpet. It's not what we expected, 
uh, it's a pause. And in this pause, uh, everyone looks and turns and they sees what's called a mighty angel. And the description of this being is just astonishing. Uh, it says that he's clothed with a cloud, his head has a rainbow on it, his face is like the sun, his feet are like fire, his feet are planted on the foot on the sea, the other upon the land, and then he cries out like a roaring lion. What a magnificent creature that thing. And what is this cry? It doesn't tell us what the cry is. It says he just cried out with a, like, like a lion, but it tells tell us what happened immediately after that crying out. And that is seven claps of thunder, boom, 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 boom. And each one of those thunderclaps is not a sound, just a sound like we know, but it's a voice speaking, a message. And look what John does in verse 4. It says, And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. All right. The title of this book is Revelation. That means to reveal. And up until now, we've been having all this revealing going on. This is the first time God says, stop. Let's not reveal that. Don't write down what's going on there. Uh, were the seven thunders, uh, seven more terrible things that were happening down upon the earth? Was it seven prophecies about what would happen in the future? We don't know. God has kept it a secret, and we just have to be patient until we learn about it someday. And that gives us a lesson to heed. We said three lessons to heed uh, to receive God's blessing. The first lesson here, and this is in your insert, teaches us be patient about the questions of life. Be patient about the questions of life. Why would God reveal these seven thunderclaps and then say, oh, by the way, we're not going to tell you what they are? Why not just ignore that, skip over that, and leave all these unanswered questions? But what was all that about? Why does God do that? Why does God let a little child get cancer and suffer terribly? Why does God let a wife lose her husband and her four children in a house fire? Why does why did God allow the Holocaust? Why did God allow 9-11? Why does God allow child abuse and human trafficking? There's a lot of questions we don't know in life and that we have no answers from God for. Not yet, at least. And we are just left to be patient and, and wait. Uh, this isn't just something that's going to happen in heaven in the future. This is a common thing that happens all the time. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that you might know that helps us when we have questions for God. Deuteronomy 29:29. 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. This says that... The, Life can be broken into two categories, the things that are revealed and the things that are secret. Things that are revealed are for us, and we're going to be held accountable for the things that are revealed. The things that aren't revealed, well, that belongs to God. And he says, I'm not going to reveal certain things, not yet at least, and I have my reasons. One of those things was what were these seven thunderclaps that was going on? And on the one hand, we could get upset and stomp our feet and shout at God and say, why did, why did you let us know about them and then not tell us what they meant? Why did you even go there? Or the other reaction could be, you know, God is a God of love who cares about us. And God is a God of wisdom who always makes the right choices. And that includes keeping from us the understanding of those thunderclaps. That's loving and wise. God says, no. If or otherwise, I'd let you know. It's not loving or wise to let you know this right now. So just be patient. We'll be patient with God. He knows what he's doing. Those are the two reactions that you can have to that. And it's the same with all the questions of life. Why does God allow a little child to get cancer? Or a wife to lose her family in a house fire? Or the Holocaust? Or many, many, many horrible, terrible, awful things we've seen people do. Some people, I was listening to a man on the TV this week, 
says, I will not believe in God because there is an insect in Africa that lays eggs in children's eyes and then they go blind. If the God could allow that, I'm, I'm not going to believe in him. I refuse to. And that's a lot of people's reaction. They lose their faith, or they shake their fist at God and say, you have a lot to answer for. On the other hand, we can have the reaction to say these things are horrible and awful and unimaginable. And we don't have answers for why God allowed them. But what is the character of God? He's loving and he cares for people. He's wise and always makes the right choices. So even though I can't imagine a good answer to this, I'm going to fall back on the character of God. When you don't understand the ways of God, fall back on the character of God. And I'm going to choose to trust him even though... I can't see a good anything out of what just happened. We trust him anyway and be patient. That's an important lesson we need to all learn. And maybe you have hard questions that you've been asking God about for years. God would say to you, stop asking why and just trust me. Be patient and I'll let you know. I believe one day God will reveal all the answers to the questions that we've had. And I believe that once we understand everything, that we will say, he was right. He was right to do that and allow that. He made a wise choice. But until now, we just have to be patient. The lesson of this chapter teaches us that there are certain experiences that God means to be kept secret. For now. There are certain experiences that God intends to be kept secret for now. And we just need to be patient. Be patient if you've got those questions. Trust him and be patient. Well, let's keep going. We turn next to verses 5 to 7. Verse 5 says, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants, the prophets. All right, so we turn back to this mighty angel again, and he lifts up his hand, and he makes a, takes an oath. And the oath is that the mystery of God is going to be finished in the day of the blowing of this trumpet, in in that time period. That's what's going to happen. Now, it says very specifically, look at verse 7, it says, the mystery of God is finished. When this, in the day this trumpet is blown, what is the mystery of God? What's he referring to? What's he talking about? The mystery of God. You might remember that throughout the New Testament, You'll, you'll see this word mystery used, and almost always it is revealed to just something that's been kept secret uh, by God. He's not shared it with us. One example is the seven thunders collapse. We don't know what that was. He's keeping it secret. That's a mystery of God. But if you'll notice here, it doesn't say a mystery of God. It says the mystery of God. That's referring to the fact that there has been one huge mystery of God that is finally going to be finished When this trumpet is blown, what is the mystery, the mystery of God? Well, it has to do with God's purpose for mankind from the very, very beginning that has been kept secret and is now known to us. Um, I remember in the Garden of Eden, way back in the Garden of Eden, it talked about the seed of the woman was coming. The seed of the woman was coming and he would crush the serpent's head. What does that mean? There's for centuries The followers of God would read that and say, the seed of the woman, and would crush the serpent's head. What is that talking about? And they just scratched their heads because they didn't know. You know, the people in Isaiah's day, David's day, they didn't have any of the understanding we have today. That was a mystery to them. And then later on, we see Jacob laying on his deathbed, and he's speaking blessings upon his children. And he says in that, he says that Shiloh is going to come. And Shiloh is going to receive the obedience of the nations. And again, centuries of Christians said, who is Shiloh? And what's this about he's going to have nations obey him? Who is that? And it was a mystery. It was a secret. 
And in Isaiah 9, it talks about the wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace, mighty God, and that person is going to reign on David's throne forever. Well, who is that? See, this has been right from the Garden of Eden, little by little, little by little, what's not very clear, a little bit more, it's getting a little bit clearer. Down through the centuries, God's been revealing this mystery instead of just coming out front. He could have said it at, at the very beginning, but he's been revealing it little by little until, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And he revealed what the mystery was all about. It was all about Jesus. Very clarifying verses of Ephesians 1.9. It says, God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It's no longer a secret. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. What is the secret plan? that God has been working since the very beginning, and now we know the secret plan is to bring everything under Jesus. That's, a, that's the picture. Not just people, but the world and the universe. Everything under Jesus is God's plan. He could have said that in the Garden of Eden. He could have said, you know what? You guys just sinned. The world has fallen, but you know what? I'm going to bring everything under Jesus one day. But instead, he said, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent and Shiloh is going to receive obedience and the everlasting father, prince of peace will receive a throne that lasts forever and ever until we come to understand, oh, okay. It's all about Jesus. Little by little by little by little, that mystery was revealed of what it's supposed to be. And that, that, this right here is the mystery that blowing that last trumpet is going to, in the day the trumpet that trumpet's blown, in those days, it says, then this mystery will be completed. It'll be done. Everything will come under Jesus. And that gives us, really, uh, a second lesson uh, for a God-blessed life. In your insert there, the second lesson to heed for a God-blessed life is be confident. Be confident about the purpose of life. Be confident about the purpose of life. If you stop someone on the street and say, hey, what do you think the purpose of life is? How many different answers do you think you're going to get? Oh, my goodness. Probably a real common one is, hey, the purpose of life is just to you know, be happy and have fun with my friends. So I get up every day. That's my goal. That's what I want to do. Other people are going to say, well, it's to get rich. That's the purpose of life. Or it's to be powerful. Or it's to become the best person I can be. Uh, to love other people and, you know, go through the world and make a, yeah. Lots and lots of ideas about what the purpose of life is. This, however, makes it absolutely crystal clear what from the very beginning of the first man and woman in the garden to where it's all leading, the purpose of life is to bring everything under Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of life. It's very easy to get sucked into the world and think the way they do to say, you, you know, you get up in the morning, what are you supposed to do? Well, you seek to be happy. You seek to you know, live the best life you can. You know, it's, uh, it's have a good time. Enjoy your friends. That's what a lot of people, a lot of Christians, view as why they get up in the morning. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, look, here's Jesus. And here's you. And that's the purpose of life. That's, that's a picture of what the purpose of life is to bring yourself under Jesus and then just walk humbly with him, to live with God as they did in the Garden of Eden, to walk with God. Your close relationship, him loving you, you loving him, that is the purpose of life. And when you do that, when you make that your purpose of life, everything else falls into place. When we miss this, nothing goes right. It's just a chaos because we're not ordering things correctly. This is the purpose of life. And my question would, to you would be, is this your understanding of the purpose of life, of why you're getting up tomorrow morning? Don't miss it. God's made it very, very clear. You don't have to scratch your head and wonder with the rest of the world, what is this all about? This is what it's all about. You coming unto Jesus and living humbly with him every day. That's what's going to fulfill your soul. It's understanding this that's going to give the meaning to your life that you're seeking. Everything else is, is 
is false. So be confident as you live through this world. You know the purpose of life. And take hold of it. Live every day in a close relationship with Jesus. All right, returning to our verses. Uh, we left out one detail about this little, or rather, magnificent angel. He's standing there with a foot on the land, foot on the sea, raising his hand to heaven, you know, he's roaring like a lion. But there's one detail we left out in verse 2, and that is what he holds in his hand. He holds in his right hand, it says in verse 2, look, and he had in his hand a little book that was open. We would call it a little scroll. A little scroll that was open. And what is it? It's a prophecy that John is supposed to preach. It's not sealed up like with seals like the first one. This one's open. And it contains what John is supposed to preach. Um, look at verse 10. It says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. But you didn't expect that. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. If you remember back in Revelation 1, Jesus appeared to John and he said, I want you to write down the things you're about to see and prophesy. And that's what we've been reading up until this very verse at the end of Revelation chapter 10. It's all that John's been writing down, all the different things he's seen. Now, from this point out, he's going to write down what's in this little scroll. And that's the rest of the book of Revelation. You've got to, you have to prophesy again. Now, why does he eat it? I mean, does anyone want to eat my sermon after I'm done here? I don't think so. But <laughs> Jesus tells him to eat it. We skip the verses where Jesus goes and says, go eat the prophecy. So he goes and he eats the prophecy. And what's the result? It's sweet in his mouth. He said, this is wonderful. But then as it gets into his stomach, it's like, ugh, I feel terrible. What was going on? First of all, he was eating it because God, it was God's way of saying, look, John, I want you to own this message. I don't want it to be something you know, that's like out there and you're, you're reading it. I want you to take it down inside you like it's food. But there's going to be a result of taking this message, God's truth, down inside you. It's going to, there's going to be a delightful part to it, and there's also going to be a bitter part of it. But it's still God's truth. Nothing's gone wrong. It's just there's sweet parts of God's truth and there's bitter parts of God's truth. And John, here's the thing. I want you to prophesy this, preach it to the nations. That was John's job. And that gives us a third lesson to heed here for God's blessing. Number three, be faithful. This is in your insert. Be faithful about God's truth, the truth of God. In the 1980s, churches in America had a shift in their thinking uh, in what became known as the seeker-sensitive church movement, seeker-sensitive church movement. And the idea was that church was kind of scary and boring for people, as it was in the United States. So let's kind of do church a new way. And we're going to emphasize making church feel comfortable and non-threatening and inviting. That was the idea. And so one of the consequences of this is they really started spending a lot more time in worship during a worship service, really increased that. And at the same time, they decreased and shrank the time for the sermon. Much more worship, much less preaching. And some of the churches, many of the churches, along with the preaching, said, let's leave out the stuff that you know, people don't like to hear. Let's leave out sin. Let's leave out hell. Let's leave out repentance. So much more music, much less preaching, and the preaching is all the sweet stuff. None of the bitter stuff. Well, what do you think happened? People came to those churches in large, huge numbers, and it was considered successful. As churches all over the United States now were getting into the thousands and thousands uh, because basically they changed the way they do church. Now, this wasn't every seeker-sensitive church, but a, a lot of them, this is what happened. And over the years until we are today, it's pretty easy to find a church that's going to talk about the sweet messages of the Bible. Not a problem about that. Finding one that will also tell you the bitter messages, which are just as important, is very hard to find. That's because a lot of people aren't wanting to hear that. And yes, some churches, on the other hand, 
major on the bitter parts and just preach the fire and brimstone preaching. And that's not a biblical balance either. Paul tells us what the right balance is and the way he preached in the church of Ephesus, Acts 20, 27. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That's the aim. That's our aim here at Samuel's church, is to preach the whole counsel of God, the, all the wonderful sweet parts and all the wonderful bitter parts. How do you say they're wonderful? Because without the bitter parts, the sweet parts aren't needed like they are. Our job is to include both the sweet and the bitter parts. We've got to be careful how we present the bitter parts. Some churches love to rail and condemn and you know, be nasty as they're presenting the bitter parts. That's absolutely sinful. Can I just say that very clearly? God says that's sin. God told Timothy what to do. He said in 2 Timothy 2.24, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind and patient and gentle when ministering to people. Kind and patient and gentle. We never have the right to share the bitter, necessary parts of the Bible in an unkind, impatient way. Never. We are only supposed to be kind and patient and gentle. That's what God calls us to do when telling people the needed bitter parts of the Bible. And you might say, but pastor, telling someone you know, that they're a sinner who's earned hell on the way to hell, that, that can make a lot of people angry. And yes, it can make a lot of people angry, and that's why many of these churches don't talk about that. They want people coming, and keep, let's keep things positive here. People have enough negative things in their life. Let's just keep things positive. We don't need to tell them all these things. They already know they're sinners. I don't believe that. I think the average person thinks they're doing just fine. They need the bitter parts. We all need the bitter parts of the Bible that says we are sinners. We have broken God's commands. We have stirred up his anger. We are headed for punishment, justified punishment in hell. And then you can tell the sweet part. But God, in his love, has provided his son to be punished in our place. And out of his kindness, he offers complete forgiveness to all who receive Christ as Lord. You don't have to work for it. Believe, and you can be saved. See how much sweeter that is when you come from the fact of understanding the hard, bitter truth that we're lost and don't have any hope, but you have hope in Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. No one can be saved without hearing the bitter parts of the, of the gospel. You can't be saved without understanding you're a sinner, that you're on your way to hell. You can't just say, look, I'll just add Jesus to my life and go on. That's not the gospel. It's you are a sinner, lost, you're never going to make it, and you're clinging to Jesus with all your heart. He's your Lord now. You have to have both versions. Uh, what happens when we don't share the bitter part? God told Ezekiel what happens. Uh, by the way, 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says, We have been entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men but God. Telling people the bitter part is not very pleasing. Many people have lost their lives through speaking the bitter parts, even in kindness and patience and gentleness, losing their lives because people don't want to hear it. But we're not out to please people. We're out to please God. He says, share the whole counsel that I've taught. And when we don't, look what God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3.17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the words that I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not warn him or speak out to turn him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sins, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. God is serious about our sharing the whole counsel of God, including the bitter parts. The world needs to hear the bitter parts of what God has to say, and he will hold us accountable when we have that opportunity and we say, no, nope, we're not going to share it. That's what he told Ezekiel. 
Yes, we want a church that's welcoming and inviting. Absolutely, we do. But we don't want to do that at the compromise of diminishing God's word and giving half of it. We want to make sure that God's word is what is declared from here. Look, there has been centuries of churches that have been simple and plain and not very flashy that have led thousands and thousands and thousands of people to Christ even though they didn't have the most dynamic speakers and they didn't have the best worship and they didn't have the most excellent bands because it's not about that. Those are tools, but you don't have to have those things. All you need is the living and active word of God. The word of God is the sword of the spirit which pierces down to the dividing of spirit and soul. It is the uh, the cerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is a fire and it is a hammer that shatters rock. And that is what saves people. It's God working with his magnificent word in their heart, convicting them of sin, drawing them to Christ, and saving their lives. These other things can be useful, but they're not necessary. And we want, again, we want the most inviting church we can, but we will never put anything in front of the most important thing, and that is the, preaching the whole counsel of God, the sweet parts and the bitter parts. They're all needed. And that's what makes a church faithful. So the third lesson to heed is being faithful about the truth of God. Are you holding back the truth from someone who needs to hear it? Do you have opportunity to share with somebody? God's given it to you, but you don't want to make them mad. You don't want to be unpopular. You don't want to make an enemy. Yes, you need to be cautious and careful and follow the Spirit's leading, but when the Spirit opens that door in front of you, cry out for boldness and speak the truth in love and patience and kindness and gentleness. Then God takes that. And it might cause someone to rush into salvation. It might cause another person to dislike you. But we're not out to please men. We're out to please God who will hold us accountable. So if you've been holding back, stop holding back. Ask God for boldness and readiness for when the opportunity comes up. People need to hear the whole counsel. So we talked at the beginning about praying for God to bless you. That's very needed. Keep that up. Don't stop that multiple times a day. But in addition, God says, I will bless you by heeding the things that are written in the book of Revelation. Today we've seen, number one, heed to be patient when you've got the questions of life. Are you being quite patient, to, uh, not blaming God for something, but saying, look, I don't have all the facts. He claims to be loving and perfect and wise. I'll trust him. Do you need to do that? How about uh, being confident about the purpose of life? Don't fall in with the people that are around you. They don't understand the purpose of life. You do. Make sure you're living that. And then number three, be faithful about the truth of God. If you're holding back, speaking difficult things, difficult truths of God to somebody, tell God you're willing, he'll let go, give you boldness, and then do it. You want to be found faithful on the day you stand eye to eye with Jesus. These are the things that if you heed them, will bring blessings into your life. We need that. And as I close, can I emphasize, emphasize the second truth as I close? Um, where are you in the purpose of life? Are you standing under Jesus? Or are you away, apart from Jesus? Which one of those describes your life? You know, some people pray the prayer of salvation... Or they walk the aisle to receive Christ, or they raise their hand when the minister says, who wants to receive Christ? And they do all that, but they never move. They go to church, they pray, they read their Bible, but they don't move. What does God say about that? that there's no reason to believe that person is a Christian. Yeah, but I, I prayed the prayer. Unless you move under Christ, which is the purpose of life, that prayer has not done what it was designed to do. 
You prayed it, but you didn't move. And there's no reason to believe that person's a Christian. Listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 16, 24 through 25. If anyone, this isn't just for a special group, anyone wishes to come after me, he must do three things. He must deny himself. He must take up his cross, that is, accept his own death. I'm dead to myself. And follow me. That's what it means to be a Christian. This is not a special option for really special, specially called Christians. Everybody. If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to deny yourself. And now I, you know, I live for myself. Deny that. <laughs> Accept your own death. That's what taking up your cross means. I die to myself. And now I follow Jesus for the rest of my life. That's the picture of a Christian. If you want a picture of what, what is a Christian, that is a picture of what a Christian is. It goes on to say, whoever wishes to save his life, okay, I, I don't want to do that, I want to save my life. You're going to lose it. But whoever wishes to lose his life for my sake, you'll find it. So there's just two types of people in this world, those who've moved themselves under Jesus and those who haven't. And in this group that haven't, there are those who just say, I don't even believe in God. And there are many, the Bible says, who will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? And he's going to say, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? You never moved under me. You had the right words. You maybe walked the aisle. You maybe said the Lord's, the sinner's prayer. But you never moved your life to live under me, denying and accepting your own death and following me for the rest of your life. He says, I don't, I don't know you. I never did. My question is, does that picture describe your relationship with Jesus? You know in your heart whether or not you have your aim as each, each day to live under Jesus as your King, God, and Savior. You know that. Does it describe you? Or have you been going through the motions? And people here at church think, well, they're there at church, and I've heard them pray, and I've heard her volunteer for things, and everyone else thinks, yeah, you're a Christian. But God knows in your, in your heart you're over here somewhere. Until you've moved, there's no reason to believe you're a Christian. This is what a Christian is. And this is what Jesus requires. If this is not the picture of you today, change that. Today, Jesus is God, King, and Savior. And you get the chance to move under him or not. I mean, to really move under him. This is what the Bible means when it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe just doesn't mean, yeah, I believe he's a God, King, and Savior. No, no, no. Demons believe that. If that's the extent of your you know, belief in God, then you have demon belief. Demons believe he's God, King, and Savior, but they never move their lives under him. Have you moved your life under Jesus? Now I follow him for the rest of my life, every day. And no, you're not going to do it perfectly, but we're not talking about, this is not a picture of your performance. Because as you speak and use language you shouldn't, you're having a hard time staying under that. As you respond to irritating people and you don't do well, you're having a hard time staying under that, and on and on. We're not, this isn't a picture of your performance. This is a picture of what you're committed to in your mind. Repentance is a mind thing, not a performance thing. It starts with the mind that says, this is the aim of my life. This is the aim of what I am committed to each day, to live under Jesus. That is the mind of a Christian. The performance varies, but the mind says no. Peter really messed up in his performance, right? But his mind was always here. He denied even knowing Jesus, but then went out and wept because his mind was, was kept on being under Jesus. Does this describe you this morning? If not, change it today. Tell him, Lord Jesus, I am sorry. I've been thinking that if I said a prayer... That's all I needed to do. If I walked to the aisle, that's all I needed to do. No. Those things are meant to lead to belief. How is a person saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. What do you have to do right now in order to be saved? You've got to believe. 
That's all you have to do. You don't have to say a prayer. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to raise your hand. You sit here right in the pew and you say, I believe that he's my God, my King, my Savior. That's my commitment. And true belief moves yourself under Jesus for the rest of your life. Does that describe you? I'd hate to get to heaven and not see you there. Yeah, he attended church every week, and yeah, I heard him pray and sang songs, but he's not here. She's not here. Make sure this describes you. If not, believe, just right there in your seat, right now as we go to prayer, just right there, right this second, believe. And say, for the rest of my life, I'm going to let Jesus be my leader. That's genuine salvation. That's the purpose of life. That's why he came. That's why he made this world. Make sure you're part of that.